Francois, and I'll be telling you about the integration of the Keras API into TensorFlow. So first of all, what is Keras? If you know about TensorFlow, you probably also know about Keras, but just in case, for those who don't know, Keras is an API that makes building deep learning models easier and faster. So it's a deep learning toolbox, and it's all about ease of use, reducing complexity, reducing, reducing cognitive load. And if you make deep learning easier to use, what happens is that you're also making it accessible to more people. So the key idea with Keras is to put deep learning into the hands of everyone. We believe that in the future, deep learning will be part of every developer's toolbox. It will not just be a tool for experts and researchers. It will be into everyone's hands. And this will happen with platforms like TensorFlow and APIs like Keras. So Keras is better understood not as a library or um, as a code base, it's more of an API spec. And it's an API spec that has uh, several different implementations. There's the Teano implementations, which was the original um, Keras iteration that I uh, released two years ago. There's the TensorFlow implementation, of course. And then there, there will be more implementations in the future. For instance, uh, Microsoft is working on a CNTK implementation of Keras. And so until now, the TensorFlow implementation existed as a separate open source repository with lots of users. And what we are doing now is that we are bringing the Keras API directly into the Keras project, into the TensorFlow project. And uh, we believe that's a big step towards making TensorFlow and deep learning accessible to everyone. So what's concretely happening is that we are bringing into TensorFlow this Keras compatibility module, tf.keras, which is an implementation of the Keras spec that's built from the ground up for TensorFlow. And so as part of this move, we are introducing into core TensorFlow new data structures, like layers, which Martin just introduced, and uh, also models, which are uh, containers for graphs of layers. So these used to be um, Keras data structures, and now they will be shared between core TensorFlow and this tf.keras module. And so because this uh, Keras implementation is built from the ground up on top of these shared data structures, it is fully compatible with all of the TensorFlow functionality. That means it's also compatible with advanced flow features, such as um, the experiment API that Martin introduced. So if you are a Keras user, here's what this means for you. First, it gives you access to more flexibility. You become able to very easily mix and match pure TensorFlow functionality with Keras functionality, so you can build more, more powerful, more flexible models. And what's more, you gain access to really advanced, really powerful features through the high level uh, TensorFlow training API that Martin mentioned. Uh, you gain access to very quick and easy distributed training for your Keras models. You gain access to training on CloudML, distributed hyperparameter tuning, which is really, really powerful. And you can very easily deploy your Keras models to production with TensorFlow serving. If you are a TensorFlow user, what does this change mean to you? Basically, it gives you access to the full uh, scope of the Keras API to make your life easier without leaving your existing TensorFlow workflow. So you can just start using the Keras API at no loss of flexibility. You don't have to adapt all of Keras. You can just adapt the layers you need, for instance. And also, it gives you um, access to any existing piece of open source Keras code. You can just go on GitHub, copy some piece of Keras code, drop it into your code base, and by just changing the imports, it will just work. So this gives you access to a lot of existing open source code that you can start leveraging. Into, into your TensorFlow workflow. So to make things a bit more concrete, I will walk you through an example of what your workflow will look like when using Keras with TensorFlow. And we'll, uh, we'll be looking at a video question answering model, and we'll be uh, using Keras to define a model to solve this problem, and we'll be training it using the high-level TensorFlow training API in a distributed setting. So this is a problem uh, that looking at, we have some videos uh, which are sampled at about 4 frames per second, uh, roughly 10 seconds per video, so we have about 40 frames per video. And um, we are asking questions about the video, about you know, what's going on in the video, about the contents. Like here we have this video of a woman uh, packing uh, objects into a car. You can ask what is a woman doing uh, with the color of her shirt, and the answer should be a single word. So we'll uh, build a deep learning model that will take as inputs the video as a sequence of frames, so about 40 frames in order, and the question, and the model should output one word, the answer. And so 
if you look at this question, uh, what's the woman doing? She's packing. It's, it's actually interesting because if you only take one uh, frame uh, and try to train a covenant, for instance, to answer the question, the problem is that um, just from one frame, she could also be unpacking as well, right? And um, the reason you know she's actually packing is because of the order of the frames. Like if you look at the second frame, the rug is outside the car, and the next frame is inside the car. And so we expect our deep learning model to be able to leverage this order to correctly answer this type of question. So needless to say, this is a tremendously difficult problem. And just a few years ago, like three or four years ago, uh, before TensorFlow, before Keras, this would only have been accessible to a handful of large companies or you know, very well-funded research labs, especially if you wanted uh, to make your model uh, train on a cluster of GPUs. And now, with TensorFlow as a platform and with, with Keras as an API, we are making this really difficult problem accessible to anyone with just basic Python scripting abilities. So we are putting the full power of deep learning into the hands of everyone. So here's a model that we will use to solve this problem. At a high level, it has two branches. There's one branch that's meant to encode uh, the video input into a single vector, and one branch meant to encode the question, so a sequence of words, into a single vector. So we have one vector encoding information about the entire video, one vector encoding information about the entire question. And then we concatenate these two vectors. And this gives us one single vector that encodes information about the entire problem, about the combination of the video and the question. And that's kind of the beauty and the magic of deep learning, is that you take um, perceptual inputs, like a video, for instance, you take semantic meaning, and you're embedding this perceptual input. And you're embedding uh, this meaning into a geometric space. You're turning meaning into vectors. And then uh, you can learn interesting transformations of these geometric spaces. So that's really like the beauty of deep learning. And so in our case, we'll be taking this vector, encoding um, the entire problem, and we'll be training a fully connected class phase on top, and it will uh, end up with a softmax over a predefined vocabulary. And so the word with the highest probability uh, in this vocabulary will be the answer to the question. So now if you, if you want to look at a higher level of detail, how do we turn a video into a single vector? How do we turn a question into a vector? So for the video, we are starting out with the video as a sequence of frames. So each frame is just an image. So it's RGB, it has a height, a width, a depth, color depth. You have a sequence of frames. You uh, use a covenant to transform each frame into a single vector. So essentially, you're using uh, the convolutional base of a pre-trained network, uh, and you do some pooling to extract one vector that encodes the visual contents of the frame. And so what you get out of this is the video encoded as a sequence of vectors, where each vector encodes the visual contents of one frame. And then you take this sequence and you run it through an LSTM. So you probably know what an LSTM is, but basically it's a, a recurrent type of network that can uh, process sequences and takes into account uh, order, right? And uh, this LSTM will output a single vector encoding information about the entire video. And for the question, um, to turn a question into a vector, we are following a very similar process. Uh, we uh, represent our question as a sequence of integers, each integer standing for a word. And then we map each word to a word vector via um, a process called embedding, right? So we get out of this uh, a sequence of words expressed as a sequence of vectors. We run it through a different LSTM layer, which will encode uh, the entire question as a single vector. So in Keras, here's the architecture that we would use uh, to implement this, um, this model. And it's uh, literally just a very simple translation of the previous graph. So for the video encoder, basically we are starting from the video as a, a 5D tensor. So the first axis will be the batch axis. Then you have the time axis. Then uh, you have a 3D tensor which encodes a frame. And so we will apply an inception V3 network pre-trained on ImageNet to every frame of this 5D tensor uh, to extract one vector, one feature vector per frame. And so out of this, we get a sequence of visual vectors which we run through an LSTM layer. And for the um, question embedding part, we are simply using an embedding layer uh, to map our question, so a sequence of integers, into a sequence of vectors, and we run that through an LSTM layer. Finally, we use a, a concat operation um, to bring together these two vectors and we stack a few dense layers, and we end up with a softmax over our, our predefined vocabulary. And we are training that with uh, 
a target answer word uh, encoded as a one hot vector. So what does the implementation look like? It's very simple. This is a, what you're seeing here is the video encoder in just five lines. So in the first line, you're just specifying um, the shape of your video input. So it's a 5D tensor uh, with a shape argument you do not actually specify the batch size. Uh, so the first axis uh, set to none is a time axis. So it's set to none because we want it to be viable. We want, we want this model to be able to process uh, videos uh, of any number of frames. And then you have the shape of a single frame. So a single frame is a 150 by 150 RGB image. So it's a tensor that's 150 by 150 by 3. In, in the next line, what we are doing in a single line is instantiating um, an inception v3 network that will automatically load pre-trained weights, so train on image nets, and we'll configure this network uh, to be doing visual feature extraction. So essentially, we'll not be including the classifier part of inception v3, only in the convolutional base, and we'll be uh, applying some uh, average pooling on top of the bottleneck layer to just extract one single vector per uh, image input. Then in the next line, we are setting uh, this covenant to be non-trainable. So what this means is that during training, we'll not be updating the weights. And why? Simply because it's a pre-trained model. And uh, if you were to update its weights while training on this new problem of question answering, we would likely be wrecking the representations that this model has already learned on ImageNet. So you don't want to do that. You just freeze it. And so what uh, uh, the next step is to use a time distributed layer to essentially take this covenant and apply it to every step of the time axis of the video input. So this time distributed layer just takes this covenant and apply it to every frame. And what comes out of this layer is simply a 3D tensor, which is a sequence uh, of visual frames, a sequence of visual vectors. So each vector standing for one frame. And finally, we run this uh, sequence tensor through uh, an LSTM layer. And this gives us one single vector encoding uh, the entire video. And as you can notice, uh, when we are um, instantiating this Keras LSTM layer, we only specify one parameter, which is the number of units uh, in the LSTM layer. And uh, if you think about it, that's quite remarkable, because there are so many um, you know, advanced configuration parameters in, uh, in this LSTM layer. Um, you know, there are a lot of best practices you have to follow when using LSTMs. For instance, you have to remember that your recurrent weights should be uh, initialized with an uh, orthogonal initialization. And you have to remember that the bias of the forget gate should be initialized to one. You know, this type of best practices that you really need to follow if you want training to go smoothly. And um, one key principle of Keras is that best practices are included. So every Keras layer has a well-optimized um, default configuration that takes into account all these best, practi best practices. So you can just rely on Keras defaults to be good default and to just you know, get your model to train out of the box without requiring you to you know, fine tune uh, every of these hyperparameters. So best practices included, and you should just you know, care about only specifying a few key parameters, like the number of units, and everything else should just work right out of the box. So for the question encoder, um, it's even simpler. We just have three lines. First, we specify um, the input tensor to the question. So every question will just be a sequence of at most uh, 100 integers. So we will uh, we'll be limited to questions that are, that are uh, 100 words long. And um, then we embed every integer into a word vector via this uh, embedding layer. And um, uh, re uh, note that uh, we use masking on this embedding layer, uh, which means that for instance, uh, if we do left adding um, on, our, on our questions, which means that uh, if the questions are, are shorter than 100 words, we will just you know, pad the rest with zeros to get to 100. And um, uh, this creates a mask, uh, which will be propagated to the recurrent uh, layer right after that. And so we finally uh, encode uh, the sequence of word vectors into a single vector via another LSTM layer. So, Note that um, when we're using this uh, pre-trained inception network, uh, it's absolutely fundamental uh, to be lo loading these, uh, these pre-trained weights um, because you're dealing with a fairly small data set. And this data set alone would not have enough data 
to allow you to uh, learn to extract interesting visual features. So you really need uh, to make this network um, actually train. You really need to be leveraging uh, these pre-trained weights. And so finally, this is uh, how you end up with the answer word. You are taking uh, the video vector and the question vector, you are concatenating them with just a concat operation. And finally, you are applying a couple of dense layers. And you're ending up with uh, a, a 1,000 units. So we'll have a vocabulary of possible answers that is just you know 1,000 uh, different words. And here's a um, step where you're specifying the training configuration uh, of your network. So uh, you're just instantiating a model, which is a container for a graph of layers. And you're instantiating them by just specifying uh, what are the inputs of the model, what are the outputs. Uh, you can have any number of inputs, any number of outputs. And uh, you are telling the model that it should use uh, the ADAM optimizer uh, during training. And uh, this allows softmax cross entropies logits. Like you can notice that uh, when specifying our, our classification layer with 1,000 units, we did not specify any activation. So it's actually a purely linear layer. And the softmax activation will be including, included with the loss. And so to sum up, this is our entire code. Uh, it's just uh, uh, in ab about 15 lines, so it's very, very short. So we are uh, essentially uh, turning this very complex architecture, uh, including uh, loading pre-train weights, into just a handful of lines. So really reducing complexity, and by allowing you to rely on default configurations for every layer, we are really reducing cognitive load. You don't have to care about uh, most of the parameters of uh, uh, your LSTM layer, for instance. And um, the best part of it, the most uh, magic part, is that because this uh, implementation of Keras is built from the ground up for TensorFlow, it's fully compatible with things like estimators and experiments. So in just one line, you can instantiate um, a TensorFlow experiment. And this gives you access to distributed training, to training on cloud ML, and so on, and also access to uh, TensorFlow serving. So in just a, a few lines, uh, you can start running your experiment associated with your question answering model, reading uh, your um, uh, video data and question data and answer data from um, a Panda data frame. You can start running it on a cluster of GPUs in just a few lines. So what you should take away from this talk is very simple. We are taking the Keras API. Um, we are bringing it into TensorFlow. It's a new implementation of Keras built from the ground up for TensorFlow. And uh, this gives you, as a Keras user, more flexibility. You can start mixing and matching uh, pure TensorFlow functionality with your Keras model. As a TensorFlow user, this gives you access to the full Keras API to make your life easier. And so you can expect uh, this Keras compatibility module to exist as tf.contrib.keras by tf1.1. Uh, and finally, tf.keras in uh, TensorFlow uh, 1.2. And so we believe this is a big step towards making TensorFlow and deep learning accessible to everyone. So that's it for me. Uh, I believe next uh, we have uh, some snacks. <laughs> Thank you for listening.